Hello. Today I would like to play for you and work with you on a piano transcription of a beautiful daydreaming song by Gabriel Fauré, Claire de Lune. I always think that Fauré's music in general, and this one in particular, flow without the need or a justification in its psychological narration to reach a climax to justify then the release into the calmness. It is like a gift that keeps on giving. Departs on the melody suspended with the accompaniment revealing the night monument highlight, the contours, and the shadows. Chiaroscuro. By leaving a little interstice of space for the melody to be alone. And then the chord coats the melody. But after the melody has sang, sung alone. And these rhythmic waves of the accompaniment, starting on the 16th knot rest, propulse and throw forward almost like a gentle breeze on the water. harp-like, subtly blossoming the harmony around the melodic line. Another thing which is so beautifully striking, but not obvious to the listener, is what is the meter? Beethoven's 109 sonata starts started before, so out of the silence of Beethoven's music of Beethoven interrupts his silence. But we don't know if this is the downbeat or this, except if we look at the music, of course. And I think leaving it suspended in the air, a bit like Fauré does with the melody on top and the harmony appearing afterwards, um, the same way it seems to be by two but in fact it's in three one two three one two three which in fact is in six Beats of a hemiola of a three, two, one, two, three. With a model plagal cadence. So, church music like the school Fauré went to for that purpose. And um, his. Um, Masters there, of course, were those who founded that school, the Niedermeyer School. And when Mr. Niedermeyer died and Fauré was living in the quarters there for several years already, late teenager at that point, and not in the secular Paris Conservatory, but in the religious school for church musicians of Niedermeyer, there was a young substitute teacher who was sent in, who was almost by a few years the same age, older, just by a few, sh yeah, shy of two years, than Fauré, Saint-Sens. So to say that Saint-Sens was Fauré's teacher is a bit far-fetched, but 
on paper it was the case and I think they kept till the end a very dear relationship. You know, it's interesting to say, when Faure was on his own deathbed in November of 24, he told his sons almost as if to reassure them, don't worry if people forget my music. A year ago Saint-Saëns died and I'm afraid people might forget his. So he was worried for Saint-Saëns' posterity after his recent death, rather than his own, reassuring his sons, don't worry if my music is forgotten. Mademoiselle Boulanger, who studied with him, always told me that he was a very gentle figure in the teaching, that he also, among other things, showed some kind of humble restraint by never giving examples from his own works, which is almost unheard of for a composition teacher. And this kind of cadences, the plagal cadence, especially modal, avoids the leading tone, so it's um, away from the tonal stamp of the stylistic time frame or ecosystem. It becomes immediately timeless. line in the right hand, which is before the voice enters for the melody, is to give us almost like a um, cursive written handwriting of a well-applied student in calligraphy. And the short sixteenth notes, solfani, on the downbeat, short, long, impulsing with grace the decoration, which in fact, obviously, it is. If it's not ornamental, it's decorative. But and it displays itself like, as I said earlier, in flowing river. Sentence, run on sentence, yes there are commas, there are punctuations, of course, it's not only like a Proust sentence, but um, pages long sometimes. And it's not a figure of literature in music, as if to say who's going to write the furthest long melodic line without punctuation or um, climax. In fact, it does, but each of the sub-phrases creates its own next build-up towards the next statement, and all that with an apparent nonchalant flow. Like some old dear friend who's telling you a story that you listen to while you do something else, almost unattentively, but as it develops, you start focusing like a wind. Where does this story bring me? In which tonality, major, minor, relative, which cadence? And the echo of the sub um, motifs, like the echo of les ondes de l'eau, like the uh, waves in the reflections of the water and possibly of the sky in it. I know most of the French music of so-called Impressionism, symbolism, as they would have liked it to be known, is based on nature. You have to realize Paris is extremely humid and cold and gray covered sky most of the fall and spring. And during the few summer months, oh, 
not only can nature um, relive in the season of its reno, re, renew life, la vie nouvelle, but also humans. And they experience so intensely living in the outskirts, for instance, of Paris, but also outside of the homes. On the river sends um, um, beautiful banks, and the painters painted them having picnics and seeing the boats float. It all appear, appears a bit like idyllic, perhaps fake. Because, of course, there are a lot of forces in action in socio-historical point of view between the Prussians, the French, the industrialization. I mean, it's a harsh time, but they democratized a certain elegance of being um, that was not only for the elite. And I think that, uh, in that sense, the combination of songs with poems and melodic lines that are sort of almost popular, like not a pop song, you wouldn't say that. That was the chanson réaliste that told the story of the, most of the time, um, suffering social um, status of people like lonely mothers, abandoned, or widows of war, and so on and so forth. Fauré, with Verlaine and with other poets who, uh, as a music, his uh, poems, he said on music, that was an interesting Freudian slip, which is the music, the words or the music itself, I think it's in both, sort of mirroring by the music of Fauré, you see the words come out, but of course in the piano version of the song there is no word, it's almost like asking a ballerina to sing a pianist to say words. Of course they are hmm, hinted, they are daydreamed, and sometimes the harmonic colorization uh, through the flow of the narration brings us through valleys and peaks and sun and shine and possibly a cloud and we hear which is unheard of since the beginning, we are mostly singing the right hand. In neighboring tones. I like that B flat, I know he didn't write it. <laughs> Forgive me for this freedom. It's one of those things you do when you are by yourself thinking about something, a book, theater play, a smile, a personality, the gracefulness of a human being, sometimes just a simple movement of the head and it means the world to you and sometimes when you enter in the world of a composer like Fauré, the land by itself, Fauré, mon pays, my country, as Françoise Gervais mentioned. Sometimes you feel a bit allowing yourself a slight transformation. It's more like um, telling a nice joke to grandpa without to be mean. But in this case, because it's, after all, also to serve the composer's wish, I will have to play.
positions, uh, I call it the bifocal, by third, relative major, original minor, and so... returns with a 6-8 inside hemiola of the 3-4 rather than the 3-2 over 2 bars in the beginning. So it's stressed in the melodic waviness, harmonized in D-flat major, of a modulation which in fact we never left, dominant of D-flat minor, 3-5. Voicing of the melodic line of the song part is has to be played out like in an aria chorale by Bach. Uh, making it up, but nevertheless, I wouldn't say it has a Bach aria character to it, but in the transcription technique, it has to be that because you have to bring out constantly. to subtly appear, not highlighted with the fluo uh, highlighter, just a little more dark in the calligraphy of the run-on sentences um, uh, writing. And uh, intertwine in the same hand with the right hand of the pianist. Ride the bike with with all the hands. Very playful. And the offbeat of harmonies, which appear just after the melody. These three layers blend in a succulent pie, the pie of forêt. doesn't exist, but in sounds. major, luminous, shadowless, n'est-ce pas Gabriel, maître forêt. And it's really written like a harp. But this time the accompaniment covers every beat, every note, all 16th notes. There's no more gaps, so the melody has to appear above it. Returning to the A section. Again, three and five. On the dominant 
domistinato. section it's already the coda regretfully you can voice out a la Schumann the bass as if there was a stem for it to bring out this walking melodic bass so characteristic for Fori he didn't write that he didn't even indicate a stem for it I think it's hidden it's, it's hinted and hidden, it's probably both. Uh, it's too obvious. It's uh, too blunt. <laughs> Le bon goût, the good taste to hint it with subtlety. Without the distract of the melodic line. La ligne, la grande ligne, la belle ligne. Too. Insistence on appoggiature avec anticipation. This anticipation on the appoggiature gives a sense of uh, sigh, wait, it's important. Yes, my dear. Of course, I. I speak about these elements in a way that they appear almost bigger than they are in their own box set, like jewels that just fit right. And sometimes you just have to shine slightly and, of course, explained, brought out, it's a bit anatomic, too much perhaps. That's the problem with explaining too much. Careful, the pedal needs to breathe so that you don't drag the harmony of the preceding residue into the next. It could happen in an acoustical room that is resonant, in which case it's fine. I mean, I like to say, but perhaps I'm wrong, we're not responsible for the architect who built the building in which we play, but for our feet and our fingers, therefore for our breathing and our texture. Um, Seasoning, almost like a seasoning of a salad dressing. Since there are so many levels of legato, legato au chocolat, legato au raisin, of course that is terrible pun. In French, franglais pun. Un jeu de mots en franglais. But, in fact, the legato is to overstay the welcome, while if he does, then it harmonizes the arpeggios, like the resonance of the harp. Which the dampers of the piano can eliminate. It sounds bony, instead of puffy. Descriptively so, narratively so, but not overstatingly so. Because then it becomes a harmony when it's a melody. With intervals and leaps uh, that are more or less intervaled and some are less uh, closer. Step, motion, and then leap. A repeated note. It's almost like a veil that just falls by the wind in a certain nonchalant way. C'est les goûts réunis. I think it's all these various tastes of melody, harmony, that harmony and rhythm, and rhythmic harmony of course, that code and charm us, in fact, more than they convince us. Oh, what was this parfum?
Oh, what a delight. Thank you for sharing.